Well, good afternoon and a warm welcome uh, to this session, uh, which is titled Ripple Effects of the War in Ukraine. What role can adaptive social protection play to prepare for and respond to anticipated global price shocks and hunger? My name is Edward Archibald. I work as an independent consultant in social protection, uh, and I'm also the lead technical advisor of the FCDO funded social protection, technical assistance, advice and resources facility, which is known as STAR. And I'm facilitating today's session. So this uh, round table is the sixth session of the Aspects series that relies on a, a World Bank framework defining the key building blocks of adaptive social protection systems. And we aim to bring uh, experts and practitioners together and foster exchange on a global basis. This is the first time we're doing a round table as part of the series. And with several experts on social protection, we wanna talk about the implications of the horrific events in Ukraine uh, for people worldwide. And particularly, we want to explore how social protection can be used to prevent and cushion yet another food crisis and hunger. To that end, we'll talk about the most up-to-date projections as well as the role that social protection could play in cushioning negative effects on the most vulnerable parts of society. To actively participate in this roundtable and particularly um, the discussion, please put questions in the chat box uh, and we'll get to them at a later part of the event. Please note the session will be recorded and uploaded to sp.org. But now to officially start the event, uh, I would ask Dr. Tanya Forwork, Director, Global Health, Pandemic Prevention and One Health, German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development at BNZ, to give us her welcoming remarks. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone. It's a pleasure for me to open this round table and to welcome our distinguished panelists and audience. Germany is happy to co-sponsor this event as supporter to the remarkable Knowledge Hub Social Protection Org and as a convener of the practice, uh, practice exchange of adaptive social protection called ASPECTS, which is organized by our implementing agency, GIZ, in cooperation with Social Protection Org. Actually, the COVID-19 pandemic is not yet over as with Russia's aggression war against Ukraine, we face another crisis of global dimensions. Millions, especially women, children, people with disabilities and elderly persons are forced to flee their homes. The solidarity shows by neighborhood countries and those that, that host refugees is enormous. These efforts need fur the further immediate emergency support and we see that the situation is really on crisis in many countries. Complementing these activities in the region, we need to prepare the global consequences of the war as well. Some of them are already clearly noticeable and visible, others, will be with us in the foreseen future. International food and food prices have already risen sharply since the conflict began, which will ultimately affect local prices and thus access to food. If the war on Ukraine results in a prolonged reduction in food exports by Ukraine and the Russian Federation, forecasts suggest that the global number of undernourished people could increase by eight to 13 million people already next year. The most pronounced increases are expected to take place in Asia Pacific, followed by Sub-Saharan Africa and the North Near East and North Africa. Increases in food commodities and food prices not only impact the well-being of households, but also threaten social peace and stability in societies. Many of the affected countries are already, already struggling to recover from the pandemic's economic outflow. 
Reducing poverty, hunger, social exclusion worldwide is a global task. And Germany works to assume this responsibility to offer just development perspectives to each and everyone. Social protection is an important part of our international cooperation since many years, and we are committed to intensify our support in this domain as outlined in our coalition treaty. We have accordingly made social protection to one of our four priority areas for German development cooperation. Social protection has an immense potential to cushion the effects of crisis and help people to cope. Cash transfers, work, public works programs, school meals and insurances, especially insurances can help people through difficult times. Where systems are built and regular social protection coverage has reached a certain scale, adaptive social protection approaches are part of a comprehensive and forward thinking solution to crisis. They offer the instruments and concepts for bridging, for bridging sectorial divides, for a coordinated response and to help operationalize, operationalize the humanitarian development peace nexus. The pandemic and the conflict in Ukraine are a stark reminder of the importance of establishing functioning national adaptive social protection systems in both stable as well as fragile contexts. But what, what role exactly can adaptive social protection can play in response to global price shocks? How can it complement a broader response package? How do we put lessons learned from COVID-19 as well as the price shock following the financial crisis in 2008 into practice for the next crisis? How can we support the countries most affected and the global consequences of the war to prepare their social protection systems? What needs to be done now so social protection can help avoid hunger and anticipate an increase in poverty? There are questions for debate and we very much look forward to the discussion and surely very interesting and timely, timely inputs from the speakers and audiences. Thank you very much on behalf of the German Development Corporation for organizing this event. And over to you, Edward. Thank you very much, Dr. Vorwerk, um, for these introductory remarks and for putting this round table into the context of German Development Corporation. Now, before I hand over to the framing presentation um, uh, and starting the discussion, I'd like to briefly introduce our presenters. Um, so Holger Matai has been working uh, on forward-looking analyses of, of agricultural markets for over 20 years um, and is now leading the medium-term outlook um, and market analysis team um, of the markets and trade division at the, the Food and Agricultural Organization. So Holger will be presenting the, the giving the framing presentation coming up in a moment. Um, Sarah Lawton is the Chief of Social Protection at WFP, uh, overseeing the, the organization's strategic direction um, in, in, so in, in this area of work. Um, she's uh, got an MSc from, from, from LSE, um, sorry, MS, yeah, MSc in Development Studies from, from LSC and 25 years of experience in humanitarian and development work uh, in country offices uh, around the world. Ugo Gentilini uh, is the Global Lead for Social Assistance at, at the World Bank. Um, he uh, works uh, on analytics and, and practice of social protection across regions and, and, and themes. Um, I'm sure many of you uh, know his work. He's published extensively in um, his weekly newsletter, um, which goes uh, to many, many of us and, and is a, a lifeline for, for many of us, which is brilliant. Um, and he's got what's uh, not in the bio, but I, I have to, of course, add in is that his, his working paper that he lead, has led on, on COVID for the last couple of years has been, has been brilliant. And now um, one starting up on, on Ukraine as well, which is uh, the social protection responses to, to, to the crisis in Ukraine. He's worked for the World Bank and, and the WFP over the, over the last couple of decades. 
Um, Sam Muradzikwa uh, is the Chief of Social Policy uh, at UNICEF Ethiopia, previously being the Chief of uh, Social Policy and Research in, at UNICEF in Zambia, UNICEF Zimbabwe. Um, previously worked as a Chief Economist and Africa Strategist in uh, the Development Bank of, of Southern Africa. Published a huge amount, um, including on public finance. He's lectured um, and been a researcher at the University of Cape Town. Um, and his work at UNICEF extends beyond social protection. It's, um, it also includes fiscal space analysis, other public finance issues, multi-dimensional child poverty, uh, data, evidence, uh, advocacy. And finally, Marco Knowles uh, is a senior social protection officer uh, with FAO's uh, social protection team. Um, he's worked for um, two and a half decades in, in UN agencies and NGOs in many different um, uh, geographies, regions. Um, works, uh, his expertise in, in social protection and expanding access um, in rural areas and then strengthening the coordination uh, with agricultural subsector and, and, uh, and natural resource management. And also a lot of experience on, on program coordination, on evidence-based um, policy assistance uh, and capacity development. So that's the, the panel. Um, uh, thank you so much to all of them for, for giving, giving their time and, and, and uh, expertise and comments today. Um, once again, um, looking forward to comments coming through on the chat, so please keep that going. Um, but now let's move to the framing presentation. So over to you, Holger Matai, for, uh, for, for your, your words. Um, we look forward to it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Edward. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, please allow me to share my screen. Okay, so Edward, can you confirm that you it's visible? Yes, that's there. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, and the opportunity to share some of our views on the global food market situation and outlook uh, here with you. We heard already some introductory uh, words from the director and I will go into more detail on that because as it is important to remember that already prior to the crisis, prices of basic foodstuffs stood at an all-time high. On the left side panel here, you see the FAO food price index. And due to crop conditions, but also high prices of energy and fertilizer in February, 2022, so before the war started, the FAO food price index reached a new record, 20% above its level a uh, year earlier and three points higher than the previous peak in February, 2011. Now the right hand kind of illustrates uh, why the current crisis really matters to that situation and has the potential and has already shown the potential to make this situation even worse. Because in 2021, wheat exports by the Russian Federation in Ukraine accounted for 30% of the global market. Combined sunflower exports were about 55%. This also extends to other markets as you see here, like for maize, barley and rapeseed oil. And not shown here, but also important to keep in mind, Russia is a crucial exporter of fertilizer. So, which is something we have to watch further down the line as it will um, affect production potential around the world, especially in countries with high intensity agriculture. Now, if we look at the import side of things, um, we note that in terms of trade networks, uh, both countries, you know, Ukraine and Russia, are key wheat suppliers to many countries in North Africa, Western and Eastern Central Asia. So just to give some numbers here, about 50 countries are dependent to these two countries for at least 30% of their wheat needs. 26 countries source over 50% of their wheat needs from them. And again, also the dependence on fertilizer from Russia is high in many countries. So this can have multiple implications for global markets and food security, because wheat especially is a staple for about 35% of the world population. And having to reroute adds cost and substitution adds cost. So 
this is really the if we have shortfalls this has the potential to, to really affect markets and this is what we're going to see here now sorry in more detail for the wheat market and what you see here is the estimates of our experts of the potential shortfall in the current season you know production is, is mainly in but what has not been exported and what potentially won't be exported from Russia and, and Ukraine is seen here as the, the hatched marks. No? About 8 million tons from Russia, 6 million tons of wheat uh, from the Ukraine. And so the importers, the main importers, for instance, that are listed here, sort of they have to battle it out for the remaining volumes. And that is exactly shown over here. The market, of course, reacts to that and drives prices up further here. So they were already up, but now they have gone. So the market figures this in, this information is out, it's well known. And we, we this is what brings prices up. So um, similar for maize, even though maize is not uh, for the most part a food crop or the, the maize that comes out of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine and Russia is feed maize. So this will reach the consumer with a delayed effect in, in terms of higher meat prices, because Again, there is a shortfall expected. A lot of importers sort of have to struggle to, to get their supplies and the, the market has factored this in. People you know, are complaining about higher feed costs in, um, for their livestock. The most severe uh, and already visible is actually for sunflower oil. I went to the supermarket here in Rome yesterday and there was no sunflower oil on the shelf anymore. It was just gone right so and that's because what we see here in this figure these two countries have an, an export share of 78 percent so when they stop exporting you can feel the shortages right away and this is what we're seeing already even though you know sunflower oil is not a critical commodity for food security necessarily but it is really it shows what may come also for others if we have really severe restrictions here also you know prices of vegetable oils and that will affect the prices for soybean and palm oil because you know there's substitution uh, for that so this is really kind of the a roundup of the current situation now we were also asked to look ahead a little bit and and this becomes very quickly very very tricky um, because what we're looking out sort of is sort of in the vast sea of uncertainty now with a million different outcomes. And all we can do is put sort of two markers in, into this uh, sea of uncertainty. Those are not projections, those are not forecasts, those are just two points to give an orientation. Because all we did here, we would, we would say, well, let's look one season ahead, 22, 23, and then uh, reduce the volume that's available for imports in the global market by 10 million tons for wheat and maize and <coughs> other amounts for other coarse grains and for other oil seeds. And then said, okay, now let's take a little more a severe case where 25 million are not available anymore for imports and five and three. And, and also raise the oil price, the crude oil price, which is in our model sort of the, the reference price for all energy. It drives the fertilizer price and it drives the, the biofuel. It, it drives cost of, of production and so on. Raise that to $100 per barrel. And then see what is sort of the sensitivity of the market to a shock like this. So simulate then back to create sort of a disequilibrium and simulate back to equilibrium and do this assuming the shock only lasts one season or the shock lasts five seasons. And that's what was, was published in our information note. And it, it was said there, but it's easy to forget. All these changes are changes from the baseline, from what we assumed without this particular shock, the market would look like. So we would actually assume that the oil prices, you know, as I said, we had very high prices but they were due to events that were seen to subside. So next season would be a better season. So prices would fall again. So the changes that you see here is a deviation from the assumptions of a return to normality. So, and as you see here, I mean, we put the decimals 
down and everything. So this is actually the presentation here that our DG gave to the G7 and he wanted <laughs> the numbers. Uh, so, but they are, you know, rough numbers. So if we take 10, 10 million tons out for, for one year and raise the oil price to hundred dollars, these prices of these major crops go up roughly 10%, give or take a few. Uh, if you sub sustain that shock for five years, some of the crops will show a rebound because of course there is compensation, right? You take 10 million out of the market and about in the short term, two, three million ton can be uh, from drawdown of stocks and from higher production in alternative sources will be compensated, but a gap remains and a gap will remain for five years. And with the higher cost, the price gap will remain uh, at, a certain, at a certain amount. And of course this will lead to um, you know, shortages in, in the food available or in the food access because of higher prices in a number of people bringing up the sort of, again, the relative abstract calculation um, of the number of undernourishment according to the SOFI methodology. Now, if you do that in a severe scenario, you get roughly double of that. You get a little more of a, of a rebound because the, the incentives are higher um, to, to enter into production in other countries. The number of undernourished doesn't quite double. I mean, this is not a linear process. It's a very you know, complicated process that the models tries to simulate here across all the world. But this gives a roughly an orientation what this isolated sort of event would add to the complex situation. Now, these were the global numbers. If we now look a little bit by our FAO regions, and I don't know if you're familiar sort of with the, uh, the FAO regions, FAO has five regional offices and the countries that are represented differ vastly in, in population size, right? So Asia Pacific is by far the largest. So we have the most population there and Sub-Saharan Africa and, and so on, you know. So that's why the, the, the absolute numbers differ quite a bit because, but if you look at the percentages, they're not that dissimilar now. So we have about 1% uh, you know, in, in, the, in, in the regions for the, for the two uh, most affected ones. But you also have to keep in mind now in, in Asia, rice is very important. So rice prices are hardly affected. While in Sub-Saharan Africa, maize and cassava is quite important. Wheat is also not that important, but then also in, in the Near East, uh, their wheat is more important, but, it, they have, but they have a higher income level. So they are really affected when wheat gets really expensive, then they are hit hard because if it's not so much, then they're not hit as hard. So it is a very complicated uh, you know, process here um, that if you have to work on the ground, so many other things play a role here. So this is really just a very rough uh, overview here of what might happen. And with that, um, I'd really sort of like to thank you uh, for your attention. Unfortunately, I cannot see any anybody, which always makes it hard uh, instead of you know, speaking to a live audience. But um, to conclude, let me recall, I think that's the situation, you know, evolves rapidly. We're constantly updating. FAO is planning to come up with a revised note uh, tomorrow. Please look for that. So this afternoon, I mean, straight from here, I have to go to the meeting to discuss this, this updated note. And I don't know if, if the, the schedule foresees any direct question to me because I, I, unfortunately I cannot stay for the, the whole uh, event, but I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Holger. That's exactly what I was just going to say. I knew that you uh, needed to head off. Uh, so um, can I just uh, ask anyone in the audience if they want to ask a question to Holger to put something in the chat straight away um and um and then and then we can we can put it to him um while i'm waiting to see if there's there's anything there um i'll just start to 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 go move back to the, the round table discussion and prepare for that so thank you holger really insightful understand 
also the distinction you're making between what we already know and then what the what you know the, the scenarios um, might be and the and the caveats around that. So in terms of the you know in terms of the roundtable discussion uh, from here, we recognise that the um, we don't yet know what the what uh, impacts might be, what the prices price uh, changes might be, um, but we can. Um, what we'd like to now focus on is is talking about what the role of you know social protection, adaptive social protection, could bring uh, to the table in terms of planning ahead um, in in a scenario where we do know that prices are already on the rise, even though we don't yet know where where things might end up. So. Um, if all the speakers could um, turn their camera on. Um, I think, Paul, it looks like no questions have come through yet that I can see. So um, thank you so much. Um, if, um, if, we don't, uh, if we don't see you again uh, before, before you need to head off and, and really, appreciate, really appreciate your insights um, and the work of, the work of FAO on this, on this issue. Thank you. Okay, so for the, the speakers, um, thanks, Olga. So for the speakers, uh, and, and once again, um, to the audience, remember to put any questions uh, in the chat. For the speakers, the way um, for, that I'm going to structure the discussion is I've got a range of sort of pillars um, of, of adaptive social protection systems that I want to ask about. Um, one of them is about data and evidence. That's one pillar. A second pillar is about policies, legislation, and, and financing. Uh, a third pillar is about um, programs, um, and also then want to ask about some cross-cutting themes. Um, so I've got those four dimensions, and then under each dimension, I've got uh, a couple of questions that I, that I want to ask, and I'll direct them to different members of the panel, um, usually one or two, uh, for, for your responses. So, um, so the first question is about it's about the pillar of data and evidence, and by that I, I, you know, I'm referring to the availability of data and evidence to understand understand the impact of, of price shocks. Um, and and so my question, and, and Sam, I'll direct this to you: How can national actors predict what the effects of a price shock might be in their country? Um, and and what role can the international community play uh, in supporting country level forecasts? Great, thanks, Ed, and um, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, I mean, firstly, I think a great presentation from FAO, very, very insightful. Um, and I think the presentation itself is part of the answer to this. Um, so, you know, there's a technical, theoretical way in which this question could be answered, then there's a more practical way. I'll, let me focus more on the practical way. So, um, in other words, on the Theoretical way, I mean, how you know how can national actors predict what effects might happen? Well, there are various um, models that could that are built into for, into forecasting, right? Um, studies that only require you know pre-price hike data and specification of relevant price or income changes um, are of particular importance to policymakers um, because they can guide evidence planning and targeting of and mitigation programs, right? So. So there are different types of models, input output models, they are um, uh, household farm models, but let me not go into the theoretical aspects. Let me, let's look more at some of the more practical things. What are these national actors looking out for when it comes to um, um, you know, um, uh, uh, trying to map what the effects of price hikes or price adjustments may be? I think firstly is that, you know, you know the the national uh, policymakers, national uh, you know governments will you know will look at at their pro their trade profile, right? Um, you know, and again, if you look at the FAO presentation, you would have seen you know the countries that are import dependent on wheat, for example, and things like this. So though, so that examination of the trade profile uh, in a national context will be important to to track how and where or what impacts are likely to happen as a result of um, uh, price shocks or price adjustments um, in international markets. Secondly, uh, you know, national actors will look at global supply chains, right? global value chains, um, but, not, but not only global value chains, but also the you know, regional, even local value chains. Um, we saw a lot of this disruption over the past two years due to COVID, for example. 
Um, and this, you know, some impacts of this nature would happen as a result of um, um, price shocks, um, you know, with a, a spike in the oil price, spike in international food prices, again, as was being pointed out in the presentation. So, so, so national actors would look at, you know, in trying to map what impacts this would have, would look at the value chains, would look at the trade profile of the country, um, you know, would look at even things like, you know, um, inflationary expectations, right? Um, because a lot of the, you know, in, you know, in, inflation is a very, you know, I mean, as many here know, um, it's not just about, you know, the prices rising and uh, rising consistently over time that creates the inflation, but it's also about how people's behaviors actually feed into, well, and or countries' behaviors feed into that inflationary process. So I think the, in, you know, national actors in trying to predict what's going to happen also need to factor in inflationary expectations, right? Because the more we expect inflation to happen as rational human beings, the more we act in a way that actually creates that inflation, right? So for example, people go out and start hoarding, um, what did he say? It was vegetable oil, um, uh, sunflower oil, right? So people are, are now expecting that, okay, this, this, you know, this will be a shortage or there's gonna be price rises. Let's go and hoard as much as we can of this um, sunflower oil. But those actions done by many people actually creates the inflation that we fear, right? So, so part of this um, 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 aspects of, um, of uh, you know, how to, predicts the impacts, you know, would also, you know, national actors would also factor in inflationary expectations, behavioral um, aspects of economics um, in the market. Um, and then finally, um, right, I mean, the, the, you know, the loss of livelihoods um, that would, you know, that would um, take place, right, as a result of, of international price shocks that may be transmitted. So the transmission of those price shocks into the local economies um, there would definitely be, um, you know, a, a mapping on how the livelihoods would be affected, especially if you consider, you know, um, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, where I'm working in, right, where ma major parts of the economies are informal economy, right, um, a lot of it is import dependent, um, and as a result, you know, uh, price shocks can have quite devastating impacts on livelihoods, but more importantly for this conversation also have impacts on vulnerable people, vulnerable groups. And, member, and just remember that you know, some groups are already vulnerable even before the, the shock. And now imagine you, you throw a shock on, on top of a, or an already vulnerable group of people um, and that could create um, a number of um, um, uh, systemic challenges, especially for a social protection um, intervention. Thank you, um, Ed. Let me end there for now. Great, great. Thanks, Sam. That's that's excellent. Um, let's move from the data point, which you've you've articulated really well, and let's move to the enabling environment and the question of policies and and, and legislation and financing. And by by this, in terms of adaptive social protection, what I'm thinking about here is the extent of the readiness of 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 the, the enabling environment the laws policies coordination structures financing mechanisms all these things how ready are they to to respond to shocks um let me ask a question on on policies first um and um to, to sarah and to, to ugo um recognizing the limited time before the impact of, of the price shocks to what extent should countries seek to develop new policies or, or strategies to support social protection systems to respond to the price shocks? Sarah first, and then Ugo. Yeah, thanks, Ed, and hi, everybody. So I think the first thing to keep in mind is that shocks only become crises when people are unable to cope with them. And what this means is that the social protection programs that countries have in place already are already going to be helping to mitigate the impact of these price shocks or indeed of, of any others. And any efforts that countries are making now to improve those social protection programs, whether that's by expanding coverage or adequacy or the range of needs that are covered, those are already 
those efforts are already going to be making a contribution to mitigating the impact. And this goes, I think, very much to the point that Dr. Uh, Vorwerk was making at the beginning about the importance of uh, functioning social protection systems in all countries. So that said, obviously, price shocks are going to have an impact on overall social protection service provision. And this might be either through, you know, a big spike in demand um, or through or and through the cost increased cost of delivering social protection um, programs and services. And countries, of course, do need plans for dealing with that and where, you know, contingency plans, risk financing, coordination and institutional arrangements are not already in place for large scale shocks or price shocks in particular, then yes, indeed, new strategies, uh, new strategies may be needed. Then obviously those kind of things are best done in advance, but you know, where that hasn't been possible, uh, whenever, you know, whenever is possible. Um, I think often of uh, uh, one of the best speakers I ever heard on this topic a number of years ago at a conference about social protection and response to shocks, a very smart guy named Stefan Durkon, who at the time was uh, the chief economist for the then DFID. And in talking about this topic and you know, what we needed to be you know, doing to prepare, he said, we all need to be thinking about, thinking more like an insurance company. Yeah, thinking like an insurance company, which means thinking in advance, ideally, about what are the risks that we're preparing for, you know, who owns this risk when this thing happens, a price shock or any other, you know, whose responsibility is it to do something about it? What are the triggers, you know, what's going to actually determine who gets what when something particular happens? How is what's promised going to actually be delivered and how is it going to be paid for? So again, I think these things can sometimes point to the need for new strategies and plans or updating of, of, of current ones. Luckily, uh, these things can also be done in a hurry uh, where needed. Over, Ed. Thanks very much, Sarah. Yeah, I think that book of uh, Stefan's talk, I think the book is called Dull Disasters, which is yeah, that that point about thinking like an insurance company it doesn't have to be um, always being exciting. It can be it can be dull. Um, Ugo, your thoughts? Sure, and uh, uh, thank you. Really, it's a great pleasure to join you all for this important conversation. Um, and I would agree really with everything that uh, uh, Sarah said, including how smart uh, Stephen is. Um, I think that. You know, and the question, do we need something new? The word new always uh, is tricky. And uh, I think we need to kind of think uh, sequentially about the issue. Uh, first, diagnose the problem at country level. There is no one-on-one -on -one transmission of crisis at country level. And understand who's, uh, who's affected across the population. We heard from Sam and Holger that this is uh, no easy task, but it's important to get the sense of the problem at country level. Then second, gauge the ability of existing systems to meet those needs. Um, in a way, stress testing uh, the ability of uh, scaling up uh, through government systems and through partner systems. Um, and at that point, if additional support is needed, I think uh, there, there is an opportunity to tap into the very rich, very recent, and to some extent, very much ongoing COVID response um, COVID responses uh, uh, in different countries. And if even that is not sufficient or needs to be modified at that point, you could think even of something, something new. And I'm stressing the COVID experience because really over the past couple of years, uh, uh, there have been over 670 new programs introduced. Um, so that's almost 90% of the response on the cash front is through new programs. Um, and, and in a way, we could consider that them not new anymore, even if they were phased out uh, at the moment for, for the most part. So instead of jumping to introduce new program for high food prices, there is perhaps a, a first a matter of uh, looking at what exists at the moment and then perhaps reawakening some of the COVID programs uh, that were recently phased out and that could be resumed and built upon. Uh, let's remember that there were also 100 programs in uh, 67 countries that reach 154 million informal sector workers uh, that are 
often net food consumers and are likely to be among those most exposed to the crisis. And more, more widely, over 760 million people were paid digi digitally, uh, over 280 million with some combination of manual and digital payments. This tells you something about the reach, I think, that could be reactivated. And those resumed programs, uh, I think, could be adapted and recalibrated to price shocks and may not need to replicate exactly the COVID blueprint. Uh, for example, they could be made, be made more uh, food security and nutrition sensitive. Uh, and in fact, you know, we start having a quite a clear eyed view of what worked and, and what didn't in each country and each program. And I think this is going to be quite important and key to inform future responses. Great. Thank you very much, Ulva. So something I'd like to ask about um, on coordination here and coordination um, institutional arrangements. And Marco, I'll, I'll put this question to you. Which actors are relevant in social protection responses to price shocks? Um, and, and what are the implications or considerations for existing coordination mechanisms? Um, thanks, Edwin. Thanks for, for uh, thanks for being invited to, to this session. Um, as I think in Honga's presentation made it very clear, no, the situation is complex. So definitely social protection has a role to play. Social protection can help the poorest in, uh, in securing their access to food or increasing their access to, uh, to food. But their ability to do so doesn't only depend on them receiving a transfer. It also depends on, on the supply side. No? Is, there a, um, is the agri-food system able to generate a supply response? Uh, and here I'm thinking about you know, uh, the ministries of trade have a role to play, the ministry of Ag ministries of agriculture have a role to play, uh, because otherwise what could be happening is we provide cash transfers to the poorest, we are increasing the purchasing power in the immediate term, they then go and purchase food, which leads to increased demand and an increase in inflation in the local, local markets that they are purchasing from. So it's important that we're able to simultaneously generate a supply response in the, in the local markets that the, these poorest households are living in, as well as perhaps uh, try and, and shift the demand of food towards food, foods that are less affected by the increase in food prices. We've seen that the, the, the major increases are in wheat, uh, in maize, not yet in rice. Uh, but here I'm thinking, for instance, in the case of Africa, it could be about triggering a shift to, to foods that are produced locally, cassava, millet, and so forth. So with this in mind, uh, it will involve uh, the coordination in this case would have to be with ministries of trade, ministries of agriculture, also with ministries of health or, or nutrition which in the case of the, the two former ones are kind of atypical ministries for the social sector to, um, to be coordinating with. These other trade, agriculture, generally consider themselves as the ministries dealing with the economy. They don't mix with ministries dealing with social issues like health, nutrition, social protection. So it's, it's a challenge. Uh, it's, it's something new and it's a challenge because they're very much different mindsets, mentalities, objectives of these, of these different sectors. Over. Thanks. Thanks, Marco. That's, that's excellent. Really interesting. I love the perspective you bring that we don't, might, might not always feature as, as frequently. So that's really, really good to hear. Okay, let's, um, let's move on from the enabling environment discussion and let's think about programs. Um, and maybe we can, and, and here in, with regard to programs, I'm thinking about the, the ability of social assistance programs to, to respond. Um, maybe let's just start with a, with a very brief recap of, of some of the key ways that social assistance programs um, can respond and, and have responded to, to shocks in the past. This might be familiar to many of you, but maybe Sarah, can you just give a brief typology of, of some of the ways that programs can respond? Yeah, sure. Okay, so the briefest typology I can give is that you can either adapt current programs or you can establish new ones. But if you give me another minute, I can elaborate. Yeah, 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 a yeah you've got bit. another minute. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I'm going to refer to the COVID responses compilation that Ugo and colleagues have been doing, and it's so great. And uh, we refer to it a lot that response tracker, 
and I think probably many of the people on the call are familiar with that. And it's looking at literally thousands of country responses to, you know, the 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 big price shock before the current one that we're talking about today. So if we look at some of the most common adaptations that you can see in social assistance and insurance programs in that tracker, you can see, um, for example, with a lot of cash transfer programs, an expansion of coverage so that people, we, we reach more people. And that's commonly in the shock responsive social protection literature called a horizontal expansion. You also see a lot of um, giving current beneficiaries of existing programs more more, you know, more money. Um, and this is often called, you know, a vertical expansion. And you also see a lot of, you know, what's less talked about, but can be really powerful of sort of design tweaks, which are little adjustments to the way a program is administered, that make it easier, maybe a change in the rules, in other words, that can make it easier for people to, you know, collect their entitlements, um, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe it's something that makes it easier for people to get their entitlements, or maybe it's a waiving of conditionalities or a change in the timing of payments, little things that make it, you know, make these programs more, more helpful to people. And in the case of, I think, a quite a, a number of countries actually changed some of the rules around their pension programs so that you could withdraw from, you could withdraw from, uh, withdraw from savings. So there are a whole, whole bunch of different um, type, there's a whole different typology there of things that can be done to existing programs. But then there's also the, the, the at least as big and maybe bigger section, which Ugo referred to, which is the, the, the establishment of, uh, of new programs. And I just want to say a word about that because I know there's always a lot of interest in like flexible scale up of existing programs. But I think it's really important to remember um, that all of the options for responding, they don't always involve existing programs that very often, you know, these are, you know, the vast majority, I think, in your, in your, in your tracker, Ugo, were actually, um, were actually new programs. But here again, there are some, there's a couple of relevant typologies to look at. And a lot of these new programs, you know, can use, um, uh, can use existing elements of a social protection system, and that's often called piggybacking. So that might be to use a targeting mechanism or a database or a financial service provider, you know, that's already in place and use that to kind of support the delivery of a new, a separate program. Um, and then finally, there's, there's always the option for alignment, which is, you know, what happened a lot and is still happening um, with some of the COVID responses where, where responses were delivered maybe by international agencies outside of the social protection system, but, you know, were, were done in a way that very deliberately tried to replicate uh, social protection. So I think those are sort of the five or six key technologies, Ed. Great. Thanks so much. That's perfect. Okay, so with that framing, let's now think about the choice of instruments. And Marco, I'll ask this first question to you: um, Which social protection, which social protection instruments have been effective in advance of price shocks hitting, and how? Um, yeah, just I think if, again setting the scene a little bit. No, we're coming out of a COVID fiscal crisis. You no, know, it's been, it's going on. It's still going on. And countries have suffered suffered a lot. That has had an implication, or that has an implication on the ability to finance uh, new interventions. And um, and the other and the other thing to bear in mind is that the poor have been going through a, a long period uh, of stress. So they are even more vulnerable than they were before. Uh, then looking back, also having said this, looking back at what were the experiences in 2008 with the social protection responses to the food crisis at the time. Um, I think one of the options is, is subsidies, but subsidies tend to be, they're easy to implement. The programs in many countries are huge. They already existing, but they tend to be regressive and they're extremely expensive. And today with the difficulty that there is in procuring um, the foods that are typically distributed through, through these programs, it's, it's, a, it's a huge challenge. Also in terms of the, the energy costs, if you decide to, okay, no longer purchase from Ukraine or Russia. I'm going to purchase from another country in Southern America. Uh, but transporting that food is going to become more expensive with the increase in the price of oil. Um, 
uh, then we could be thinking of school meals. That's that's again an option, but uh, there are huge costs associated now with procuring the food unless you do so locally, but that could also have inflationary impacts. And these school feeding programs aren't always reaching uh, the poorest. Uh, they, target, they tend to be targeted geographically, and so it's not, it's, they don't exclusively re uh, reach um, the poorest. In-kind food transfers, that's another option. Uh, but again, as I was mentioning earlier, there's this increase in the price of increase in the price of food, uh, and it's going to be very expensive to transport the food around the country with the increase in the, in the cost of, of oil. So based on this, as I go through this list of exclusions, um, and looking again at the experience in 2008, uh, my understanding is cash transfer cash, cash transfer programs that are targeted to the poorest. Uh, are the instruments that should, that should be prioritized now. I'm saying this because yes, everyone is affected uh, by, the, by the increase in the price of food, but some people are affected more than others. And these are the people that we should be reaching with these programs. We have the example of uh, uh, Mexico and Brazil in, 2000 and in 2008 that increased the value of the cash transfer uh, that was provided through the programs in order to help the poorest households mitigate the impacts um, of the shock. Um, then we have still in the among the cash transfer programs, public works programs, and these can be can play two roles: one in increasing the uh, purchasing power of these households, but also use these programs to to mitigate some of the some of the risks that are associated with the current situation. So, for instance, they could be restoring land in order to to allow uh, for the cultivation of new crops that maybe pulses or cassava, millet, as I was saying. As I was saying earlier, uh, that rely uh, uh, have less needs for for fertilizer for inputs such as fertilizers and pesticides, which are becoming increasingly expensive. Uh, and then there's the option of uh, nutrition sen sensitive social protection programs, which again can be used for both uh, at the same time increasing the purchasing power through the transfers that they provide, and through nutrition mess messaging encouraging households. To, to consume equally or even more nutritious uh, crops that aren't affected by the increase in, in food prices. And then, as I was saying earlier, it, it's, it's important to also have non-social protection programs, or what are not typically considered social protection programs, but are programs from the agricultural sector that can, that can uh, trigger, help trigger a supply response, at least at the, at the local level. Thank you, thank you, Marco. Um, excellent. So, really, really interesting across the across an array of across an array of instruments there, and you have covered, you know, part of uh, part of my next um, question was also thinking about the circumstances where interest instruments are more relevant than others um, in in different contexts, and you've covered some of that, which has been excellent. But Ugo, is there anything, you know, something you'd like to add there about this choice of instruments and the circumstances in in which they're appropriate or relevant? Yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, Marco led out uh, <laughs> led it out very well. Um, so there is, I think, a lot that could be said about specific interventions, and each of them comes with advantages and limitations. So when when I think of uh, contexts, circumstances, uh, let me perhaps focus on a, on a cross cut on the cross cutting issue of transfer modalities and the selection of that. That you know. Uh, underpins a number of different programs. So the question of whether to give cash, uh, food vouchers, uh, or other modalities. And this is really a, an issue that I think is sometimes polarizing and uh, we should tackle it in a very balanced and empirically grounded way. So three main points here. Uh, first is a question of what's avail available to build upon. Uh, cash transfers, the coverage of cash transfers was six times higher than that of income transfers uh, during COVID. Um, we know cash reached uh, about 1.3 billion people. A lot of that, however, is being uh, phased out. So when we look at the pre-COVID situation and the coverage of cash and income transfers, it, it, might be, it might appear a little bit surprising that actually income transfers are systematically higher the coverage than, than cash transfers across country income groups. And that difference tends to shrink as income rise, uh, but um, uh, they tend to be higher. Um, 
So that's one point on scale. The second point is that we need to be very clear about what, what we know about the evidence on effectiveness and efficiency on those transfer modalities. So on average, when we look at the impacts on food security, in, uh, the effects tend to be similar in terms of dietary diversity, consumption, et cetera. I say on average, design has a big role to play there. But when we look at the efficiency, cash transfers are between 13 and 23% cheaper than income transfers with some rare exceptions. Um, note also, though, that there is a lot of attention that needs to be paid on market dynamics, uh, especially in context of high inflation. I think there are some unintended effects that could be generated either way. Um, and also looking at preferences, uh, there are a couple of interesting papers, uh, one on, uh, from India and one from Ethiopia, for example, that uh, uh, show that sometimes people do prefer income transfer for its uh, Kind of insurance function against inflation. So we need we need to look also at preferences very much. Third point is on timeliness. Um, cash tend to be quite fast um, to be distributed. Um, we show that uh, uh, on average, however, uh, it takes about 20, 26 days, at least during COVID, from the time of uh, announcement of a program to the first payment. Um, and a lot depend on the pre-existing systems. Where those pre-existing systems uh, are effective, where they are in place, it could take zero days uh, to deliver cash. That's the case of Paraguay, for example. The same day, the day, the same day cash was announced in terms of uh, vertical expansion, the same day that happened. In other cases where you didn't have that system in place, We've seen that food transfers were actually faster, for example, in the Philippines than the SIP-1 program because there weren't really the, the various uh, uh, delivery building blocks in place for its delivery. Things improved over time. Uh, that's another fascinating thing that we have observed in COVID on how sometimes there were big bottlenecks in the first phases and how they were resolved and really things improved on, on, uh, after the six months and into the, the second year. So by now, a country like Philippines may have actually the infrastructure to reach with cash transfers about 70% of the population. Great. Thank you so much, Ogo. That's, that's excellent. So, okay, let's, let's switch gears a little bit here, move from, from the programs um, uh, and talk about some of the cross, some cross-cutting themes. Um, and Sam, I'll, I'll bring, you, bring you back in here and let's think about gender um, gender equity, social inclusion um, as a, as a cross-cutting theme that might go across uh, you know, the enabling environment, it might go across programs, might go across a delivery systems. Um, what are, for you, Sam, what are two to three considerations you would suggest for ensuring that a, a social um, protection response to price shocks is designed and implemented in a way that's sensitive to, to gender equity and, and social inclusion? Thank you, Ed. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, okay. So, firstly, firstly, you know, to you know, um, in the design, I think, I think, you know, we, you know, to, the first step is even in the design of 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 the program to ensure that that um, that that in that process we we are include, you know, that you include um, uh, uh, women. In, as part of the design of the program. So it must start from the very, very beginning. We mustn't design programs and then try and make them gender sensitive. We should rather be saying that, the, you know, that you've already agreed that this program needs to be gender responsive. So therefore let's make sure that in the design we are including as, uh, as many um, uh, uh, women, um, girls, and is as part of the design and the, and the testing of any of any of any programs um, at that stage. Um, of course, we have to make sure that you know that you know in the program that we are specifically, purposefully, uh, targeting um, um, uh, 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 you know uh, uh, populations you know to, targeting women and girls to reach with this um, uh, with with social protection assistance. Right. So it has to be very purposeful, very direct. 
uh, unapologetic about it, right? So, you know, that has to be, you know, so for instance, we, talk, we, we can talk about, okay, we're going to, you know, we need to make sure that we look at pregnant and um, uh, breastfeeding mothers, or we need to make sure that, that female headed households, or, you know, so we need to really take those deliberate actions to ensure that um, we are targeting those, you know, the girls and women in the, in the program. We also need to ensure that that population, you know, that the, the, the population data is always disaggregated, right? By age, by gender, and of course by disability. So this is again important, so that we are able to report to to know exactly how many girls, how many women are being reached by the program. Is the program being seen as as gender responsive? And then the fourth point, we need to consider GBV risks and and needs identified when designing these programs, right? Designing social protection programs, um, when we're designing programs or targets or results, right? Um, we need to include uh, practical and appropriate GBV um, mitigation actions and actions for survivors of GBV to have access to timely quality and multi-sectoral support services. I think, right, so, you know, we know from, from experience, but also from literature, that you know, sometimes um, cash transfers have the unintended consequence of exposing women to GBV uh, aspects. We've seen that in a couple of settings. So, so making sure that from the very beginning, we are considering these risks, um, we are identifying what the needs would be to mitigate these risks and also to provide um, the available services to, to, uh, to women in case of the event of, of, um, of uh, actualization of these GBV risks. Um, and, and then, of course, you know, research related to gender and social protection programming have focused largely on assessing the associations between uh, uh, variations in design features and gender outcomes, right? And at the same time, research and analysis have paid limited, you know, scant attention to how the nature and quality of implementation of gender provisions, um, right, uh, um, affect gender outcomes. And I think this right is a right you know something that we need to look more into something that again we are grappling with uh, with that uh, here in ethiopia at the, at the moment right uh, there's a lack of the empirical evidence on how different implementation arrangements influence the realization of gender um, um equality outcomes so so yes i think this it is an important um you know aspect i think there are a number of um, um points that I've, I've highlighted in terms of that we need to really consider um, and let me stop here and um, hand back to you, Ed. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dan. Excellent. Covered, covered a lot of a lot of important issues and, and ground there. Let me let me go to a different cross-cutting theme of, of conflict. And 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 Sarah, maybe you can come in here. Um, and then Sam, maybe a quick quick comment from you afterwards as well. The question: um, you know, What are the implications of, of social protection responses to price shocks in in contexts affected by conflict? Um, and I think there was actually a, there might have even been a, a, a question that was um, in the in the Q and A that was similar to that. Um, no, it wasn't in the Q and A. I think it, I think it went into the maybe it was in the in the broader chat. Some some. Um, what what have we learned? Okay, what lessons have we learned from the conflict to ensure preparedness to reduce the impact of conflict on food security? So maybe um, maybe if if you can incorporate that, um, Sarah, in your response. Sure, Ed. So okay. So obviously, uh, you know, contexts of conflict in particular do throw up some specific challenges. But I'd say collectively, we're learning quite a lot um, from countries like Haiti and Somalia and uh, Mali and Iraq and so on about what it actually takes to improve social protection in these settings. And I think the main implication for social protection of working in these, in these, set, in these settings is that um, interlinkages with other sectors are um, inevitable and important. And particularly, um, I mean, with actors in the humanitarian space, the development space, and in some cases, peace actors as well. So I think what characterizes social protection work in those settings is really that it is, it's, these tend to be quite a shared space among humanitarian and development actors, including social protection actors. 
uh, and sometimes peace as well. And what that means is that social protect, you know, responses to a shock um, may not always be social protection responses in the sense that they may not always be led by social protection actors. But what is really fundamental is that there be collaboration, coherent, deliberate efforts toward collaboration, coherence, and complementarity um, among humanitarian, as I said, development, including SP um, and peace actors. And you know what we do to, to fostering this shared space can be really difficult. It's often, you know, non-linear. There are certainly, um, you know, tensions, and there are often some trade-offs that need to be uh, discussed and made. For example, between life-saving sorts of activities um, and the development of sustainable state structures. So, I think responding to shocks immediately, but then also looking at you know, improving social protection longer term in these settings really means, you know, a, a strong collective effort to understand like the causes of fragility and vulnerability, um, a collective commitment to, you know, conflict sensitive programming and really some careful consideration to how, hum how specifically humanitarian work is going to be laying the ground work for something longer term, uh, but not only that, how, how humanitarians are also going to be expected to interact with, you know, development actors and so on during phases of transition. So I think multi-stakeholder kind of analyses um, ends up being very appropriate. Thanks a lot. Sam, what about you? You're on the on the ground there in, in Ethiopia. I guess some insights, mm -hmm. I'm sure, from, uh, from the last uh, year or year and a half. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, the challenges um, of uh, the, or the implications of social protection responses to price shocks in context of fra fragility or conflict. I mean, classic example here in Ethiopia. Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, the first point, I agree um, with what Sarah has said, right? Um, you know, um, you know, given the complexity and, and the challenges, there's also one other, uh, you know, a couple of other points I just wanted to add on to build on that. Um, so firstly, I think one of the things that we have um, uh, observed uh, in, in, in implementing a, um, a social protection or humanitarian cash transfers, if you want, for, um, you know, you know um, in, in, the, in the time of conflict um, is, and especially when there are price rises. So we've also been experiencing a lot of high, you know, uh, price rises in, Ethi in Ethiopia, is the tendency of such large amounts of money in one specific area or location to start to generate very localized inflation. I think this is the point that was being made earlier. I think um, Marco was making the point that, um, you know, so, you know, we've we've taken funding in and we've, we've tried to support people who have been displaced, for example, um, and with all of this money in one location, it is actually causing, uh, you know, the, it's one of the impacts is that it's causing um, speculative behavior on behalf of, of, of suppliers to increase prices because of, you know, they can see that, that you know, this cash. So this, the, so this uh, you know, it's creating these vol volatile kind of price swings in local markets, very localized, um, uh, where cash payments under social protection are happening. So that's one thing that we've noticed. Um, and of course, it requires, uh, you know, further kind of uh, engagement um, beyond just the social protection sector, but with the private, local private sector communities. Um, the second um, uh, point of, uh, you know, in terms of social protection and, um, in, you know, responding to price shocks in times of conflict is, is, uh, is again on the previous point, which, uh, which I made around, you know, um, you, know the, you know, conflict has, brings about a lot of um, GBV and, and, and sexual exploitation and abuse. And, um, you know, so, you know, there is always a risk, unless it's mitigated well, always a risk that, you know, you know, a social protection response can further expose girls and women, and even boys, to, um, to um, you know, to GBV and, and, and sexual exploitation and abuse. So we need to, to you know, to always uh, uh, factor that in. Um, but thirdly, and, and finally, uh, on the, uh, my contribution on this point is that, but we also see that the social protection in the times of fragility can also be that nexus between the development, humanitarian, and peace, right? Um, you know, so the, you know, so it's, it says, um, you know, so, you know, it's conflict and prices are rising. 
Um, but what we've also been observing, you know, and we're still studying it further, is that the social protection could be one, could be that tool, um, you know, especially humanitarian cash transfers that that straddles between development, humanitarian, and peace nexus, um, ensuring better resilience of households, ability to recover from the shock, um, to rebuild their local assets, and things like this. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Well, that's a perfect segue into the into the the, the final cross-cutting theme that I want to raise, and this is the final question before we go to the to the Q and A, um, which is about the the linkages with uh, between the social protection system and and the humanitarian sector. So, um, as you're alluding to, Sam and and Ugo, I'll put this uh, to you first, and and then to Sarah. Um, is there scope to link approaches uh, from the humanitarian sector and the social protection sector in responding to price shocks? And, and if so, how? I would say a resounding yes. Um, I think there is uh, a lot of energy around uh, the convergence between social protection, humanitarian assistance. Uh, ECHO recently released a new, um, new guidance where Social on humanitarian assistance and social protection was featured really prominently in the first section of the guidance. There are a number of great examples uh, that we have also captured together with Sarah and other colleagues uh, over the years. Um, so we see a lot of uh, further convergence uh, on a number of different functions, if you wish, from assessments down to delivery. At the same time, I think there is uh, still a big divide in practice. And if we look at um, how much of humanitarian assistance is channeled through domestic and local structures, that's only 3%. Um, so the, the, the issue of parallel systems is still there. Um, but I think that there are steps uh, that are being taken uh, that are helping to narrow that gap. Um, if we just look over the past year, past year and a half, um, uh, government social protection systems being extended to people typically covered through humanitarian assistance, uh, including refugees in Cameroon, Colombia, Congo, Djibouti, Panama, and elsewhere, or government using, utilizing some of the tools developed by humanitarians. Uh, I think of UNICEF's uh, Rapid Pro tool in, uh, in Jordan, for example. Um, and humanitarian assistance has been also using more and more government systems uh, um, in Colombia, tapping and accessing the government database, the CISBEN, uh, or aligning uh, design uh, choices on size, duration, and payment. Again, Colombia, Jordan, Peru, Turkey, and many others. Um, one final point. There are three areas where I really think there could be better linkages and a lot of scope for learning from each other. Number one, early warning systems. Um, many social protection systems don't have early warnings. Um, so that uh, uh, makes scale up decisions more challenging and more idiosyncratic instead of informed on, uh, by uh, diagnostics and automatic uh, stabilizers. Humanitarian assistance uses early warning systems. Um, in many cases, uh, um, uh, the IPC is one case. Um, how do we converge that? How do we make uh, social protection more adaptive? And you do need the uh, early warning systems. I think there is a lot to learn from, from the humanitarians there. Second, measuring markets. Marco pointed that out. Um, the importance of understanding markets, also for transfer choices, cash in kind. There is no unified operational definition of what is a working market. How do we measure it? And how could that be embedded into decision frameworks? Ethiopia, where, where Sam is, has, has a proxy for that in the PSMP, but uh, uh, much more should be done, I think, on, on that front. Finally, index linking transfers to inflation. Easier said than done. Uh, to keep purchasing power, to inform switch between, switches between transfer modalities, um, there are there is an interesting publication by Kalp uh, that was released uh, if, uh, a few months ago that looks at context of hyperinflation and some of the practices of fragile states. I think that uh, also in that in this case, uh, this is something that uh, social protection systems uh, could learn from the humanitarians and vice versa. 
um, but um, uh, really looking at experiences on how to better link, including this, <laughs> nothing is more salient than, than that at this moment, uh, um, how to anchor um, transfers, I think, to uh, food prices, other consumer price indexes, in a way that really maintains purchasing power, it's, uh, it's going to be a big priority moving forward. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot, Hugo. Sarah, your thoughts on this question? Yeah, so also it's a yes from me, for sure. A lot of good work. In fact, Hugo and I have collaborated on this in past, looking at alignment. Um, and in, in our terminology now in WP, we call these sorts of deliberate alignment seeking complementary action. And so maybe what I could say is just, I mean, to be really practical about what that looks like, you know, on the ground from the point of an agency. Um, you know, there are several, we brought at least six or seven different specific ways of seeking linkages between humanitarian um, actors and social protection. Of course, it depends totally on what's in place uh, already in the country. Um, and so in some places where you have very little in place in terms of social protection systems and programs, you know, humanitarian actors can look to fill um, gaps or to set up something that can be left behind. And they might do this by, you know, modeling something new that could be picked up later. They might do this by establishing something new, you know, a new program or some building block of a system for intended for some eventual transition. Or they may do this, you know, simply by really good coordination with other international actors so that at least all the international actors are, you know, delivering the same transfer value to people using a common targeting methodology. So that's, those are some of the specific things that humanitarians can do in contexts where there really is very little in terms of national social protection. But then, of course, in most contexts, there are already some components in place. Um, and so the question is, how practically can humanitarian actors, you know, link with, with social protection where there is something in place? And again, here, there are a few different specific, um, you know, models. So humanitarians can sometimes, you know, replicate what national social protection is doing in a way that enables them to sort of fill in a time bound way some specific gap like uh, you, okay, Hugo, you mentioned Colombia, but like WFP, for example, in Colombia, the request of the government has a specific, fills a specific gap for people who aren't yet in the National Social Protection Program, but they're on the C-SPAN database, um, and we support them, you know, using the same eligibility criteria and transfer value, and of course, that's a, that's a temporary thing. So you can also, I think, as Hugo said, you know, humanitarians can use components of an existing system, maybe to help them target or identify people or, you know, to make payments, um, or can at the very least coordinate what they're doing uh, with the national system so that even if things are being implemented independently, um, you know, those programs have similar features to what national social protection is doing. And there's some good examples in that in, in, in Mali and, 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 and elsewhere in, in West Africa and other places as well. So, and obviously, uh, you know, a knowledge and evidence sharing are relevant, um, relevant almost everywhere. And I think that humanitarian social protection learning uh, can really go, go both ways. So that's, that's that. The last thing I, point maybe I just wanna make is all of this, you know, when we're talking about humanitarian SP linkages, um, I'm kind of using the, um, the definition of humanitarian that is like a synonym for emergency response. But of course, there are, there's also another interpretation of humanitarian, which is, you know, what, what, what goes on in context where, you know, conflict context where international humanitarian law applies. So I just simply want to make the case that it's not everywhere that you would expect. There are some contexts where you wouldn't necessarily expect there to be linkages where the humanitarian and the social protection, you know, for, for, for certain reasons, you know, need to stay separate. So um, I just want to make that point as well. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, great. Thanks very much. Okay, I want to just want to conclude on, our, on, the, on the panel discussion there um, and go to a couple of the questions. Ugo, I'm just going to give you a heads up because I think there are three questions there that I, I can, we can probably, um, I might ask you to, to cover off. Um, some of it might just be very brief. 
Um, and then um, I think we probably won't have time to get to some of the others. And then I, I'd still like the panelists to wrap up. So the three questions that will go, one is, um, I think is really about what the World Bank might be doing about the analysis of you know, people. Um, it's really about the homogeneity or heterogeneity of poverty impacts um, at country level. That's really the first question. And this came up in COVID. So just be interested to know what the bank might, if you know what the bank might be doing or others. Um, a question from Rachel Slater about caseloads. Um, uh, and, I'm, and I'm picking on you here, you here, we'll go just thinking about your global global knowledge. But please, other panel members do, do jump in if you've, if you've got a contribution. So the question from Rachel. And then the, 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 the question from Sarah Blinn. Um, about whether, whether countries that did not use social assistance um, or, or multi-purpose cash as a response to COVID. I mean, there, for me, there were so many that did respond. Um, so it's quite a difficult question as to sort of, you know, were there pockets that didn't. It might not be about who, you know, to what extent, it might be rather to what extent there was, there was a response rather than, than whether a response existed. But just in, in light of time, we've got about 10 minutes left in the discussion overall. If you can just quick, quickly cover off those and then we might need to move to our, to our conclusion. Go ahead, Ugo. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ed, for uh, assigning all the questions to me. Um, uh, no, these are, are, are fantastic, uh, fantastic points. There are actually, I think, a couple more uh, in the chat. I think that uh, Gabrielle and, uh, and, and Richard uh, touched upon uh, some uh, very compelling points on, uh, on, uh, on financing that we can also uh, discuss. Um, so I, as I mentioned, you know, in my, in my initial and the first question that you asked, it's really important to uh, I think have a very clear diagnostic of uh, how prices and mechanisms through which prices or being transmitted. Um, this can be quite different from the experience in 2009 and uh, uh, 2008 and 9. Um, and uh, um, of course, the, the way in which uh, 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 the policy framework kind of shields different countries from uh, uh, global volatility can be quite diverse. So in each country, understanding um, how the crisis is uh, affecting uh, uh, different uh, populations across the distribution is going to be very important. Um, some countries have already, uh, as we speak, have, have already started uh, uh, scaling up. Um, you know, Egypt in, uh, on Monday, um, Egypt announced that uh, it would reach uh, 450,000 new, new families under the Takaful and Karama social protection programs. Um, and uh, and also made uh, some budgetary allocations uh, for those responses. So this is already happening. For when it comes to even the energy part, uh, we have seen that uh, in Italy, France, and Belgium, uh, there were already subsidies put in place uh, in that regard. So we hope that we're gonna also be able to to track this. Um, I, I don't want to go too far in, uh, in in seeing what the what the bank would do. There are more uh, authoritative voices uh, that they're going to um, uh, speak about that. Uh, but, uh, but certainly, I think there is a lot that can be done on the diagnostic side and on the, on the response side, um, and, and more gonna, gonna, I think, going to be announced soon. Um, what I would say on, uh, on what um, uh, Rachel raised on caseloads, also that is it's hard to, to say at the moment. Um, you know, on how many people might uh, be affected, if, if I understood correctly um, your, uh, your question, Rachel. Um, but that has to be part of uh, the diagnostic that, uh, that I just mentioned. Um, it was interesting to see what uh, Holger at the beginning presented um, in terms of uh, possible projection and needs. And that's, that's also going to be one uh, complicating factor is not just uh, who's, uh, who's going to be exposed and affected now is also moving forward the medium term scenarios and uh, and having uh, a diagnostic that that evolves so it's not just a, a one off but uh, a continuous assessment and having systems that uh, co evolve with uh, with that information um, and and depending on how the scenario uh, is going to evolve uh, Holger was was very very 
be clear, there is a lot of uncertainty at the moment, but uh, as mentioned, some countries have already started um, scaling up as, uh, as we speak. Um, I also think that one of the points that uh, uh, I think uh, Richard has, uh, has mentioned is, uh, is quite, uh, quite key. Uh, big elephant in the room at the moment is, uh, in a way, where is the money going to come from? Um, there is, uh, I think there is a lot of fatigue after two years of extensive COVID responses um, and, um, and uh, a historical response in magnitude and uh, plus the displacement crisis, plus high food crisis. I think that's a, an important conversation uh, um, to have um, with an understanding that countries are really facing this possibly very severe crisis, probably at the worst moment, just out of a very expansionary uh, fiscal phase. I'll stop here. Thank you, Ed. Great. Thanks, Ugo. Look, what I might uh, what I might do is I want I do want to ask I see now there are there are some extra questions um, down the bottom that I that I hadn't seen. Um, we will respond. The panel will respond to these questions afterwards um, in in writing. So we will we'll gather a few responses. So for those that um, that that haven't been haven't been addressed yet, I'm sorry uh, we haven't don't have time, but we will we will get to those and they'll be up on the on the website afterwards. So let's um, just have some, some brief closing reflections from, from each of um, the panel members. And what I want here is a couple of points, one, two or three, you know, concrete steps on, on what national actors could be doing um, now to prepare their social protection systems to, to respond to a, a price shock. Um, and what role does the, the international community have um, and how can they prepare and, and, and support? Um, so, um, uh, Marco, do you want to go first, um, then Sarah, then Sam, then Ugo? Sure, thanks. Ed. So, I think the international community, we have a responsibility to take stock of the experience that we've gained so far, both in, in respond, responding to COVID, and Ugo has already shared some of the insights we've gained from that, and also reflecting on what happened in 2008 there are lessons there the world bank did a, a very useful review review about that so we should take stock of that and share that information with uh, with the community the broader community and then in terms of financing as ugo was saying for, you know ministries of finance are really strained after COVID, and here there's a responsibility especially for international financial institutions to help fill the gap there are important initiatives that are taking place globally to, you know, to try and ensure that most of the financing for social protection programs comes from national resources. Yes, very important. That's for the longer term. There's an emergency now. We need to help ministries of finance respond. Uh, and then with respect to, to countries themselves, a little bit really uh, duplicating what Sam and Ugo mentioned earlier, it's about integrating um, price information into early warning systems and integrating this in turn in, uh, into social protection systems. I find it striking, and also speak for myself, that we're talking about high food prices only today, but they have been increasing for the last two years pretty dramatically. Uh, looking at the graphs, it's a spike. Yeah. But we're only talking about it now because probably the, uh, the Ukraine crisis is grabbing our, our attention. Um, and then I think it's about, for national governments, it's about identifying which programs they can use to, to respond, and those are the programs that best reach the poorest, the poorest households. Wonderful. Thank you, Marco. Sarah, your thoughts? Yeah, okay. So I think a few of the most important things that we collectively need to be doing is one, just focus on making sure we're understanding uh, understanding the problem. So collective definition of the problem, not only at global level, but at the level of specific countries is really important. What impact are we talking about wanting to address? On whom is this impact? Let's not start with any assumptions, but let's start with a collective stock taking of where we're at. Um, and related to that, you know, where we want to be, you know, what's the priority objective? There are going to be some hard choices probably made. Um, 
supporting newly vulnerable caseloads, supporting uh, you know established caseloads who may be more vulnerable, there are going to be a number of choices to be made. So the, the closer we can come, again, this is very, very context specific to kind of a collective understanding of what that priority objective is and buy-in with that is important. And third, I think is just looking at options. And this comes a little bit to actually to Rachel's question um, or my interpretation of her question in the chat, which is, you know, what happens where the current system, you know, if, if the current system, you know, doesn't necessarily have those people in it who are, you know, we're determining to be uh, most vulnerable. So um, just options, trade-offs, alternatives, and so on need, need, need to be looked at. And I think these are all areas that have an, an important role for the international community as well uh, to support, as well as in, um, you know, again, as Ubo was, has been doing so helpfully for so long as in monitoring and tracking. Great. Thanks a lot. Sam. Yeah, great. Um, no, and I agree with with, um, uh, with Marco and Sarah. Just to add maybe two two quick points, maybe three. So firstly, I think, you know, you know, based on our experience on trying to do a horizontal expansion, we've also realized that it's it's very important to invest in in, um, in getting the, the, the registries in order, whether it's a single registry of beneficiaries, whether it's a, 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 some variation thereof, uh, right? Because this has been a real big challenge in some of the contexts that we've, we've worked in. That's the first thing. So investing in getting these registries sorted out. Secondly, ensuring the social protection, legal and policies uh, frameworks are in place, right? Again, we found a big problem in Ethiopia, for example, where when the crisis broke in the northern Ethiopia, the conflict, the existing safety nets found it. In, uh, they found themselves in a situation where they couldn't support internally displaced populations. Doesn't it, it? Can't given the existing. So the policy, the framework is not there to support. Um, and then we had to, therefore we had to create not an alternative but a separate program to support these IDPs. Um, as a result of the conflict. So getting our policies and legal frameworks ready for crises of, of any nature is, is important. And thirdly, I think this is a point that Marco has already made, I'll reinforce it, sustainable financing for social protection, um, predictable flows of funds, uh, whether that predictability comes from earmarked funding from specific revenue sources or, you know, but certainly what we've seen is that, gov that in these crises, social protection tends to be disproportionately funded by the donor community. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sam. Ugo, your, your takeaways. Takeaways. Um, at the beginning, one of the first graphs that uh, we looked at uh, when we started the event was uh, the trajectory of prices. So it's, it's very it's obvious, the comparison to 2008 and 9. Uh, good news is that uh, we have now, compared to a decade ago, much better delivery systems. Uh, it's really spectacular to, to see the progress on that front. We didn't have that when responding in 2008 and nine. Bad news is what we just discussed, the scale up fatigue, and that uh, countries are just out of uh, 3 trillion in fiscal stimulus for social protection, only about 2% of GDP per country, even if highly uneven across, uh, across countries and regions, but, but still, uh, countries made a big effort. And in, in COVID itself, the shock that we're still dealing with is not really gone. We're, st we're still dealing with it. The nature of the response uh, has been quite different. Let's remember we had a big scale up because there was a big role that governments played in containing uh, the pandemic. So it was almost a transaction, containment policy, compensation. Uh, in this case, we, we may not have containment policies necessarily, so the question is whether we're going to see uh, measures of similar scale. It's, I think it's a, it's a question mark. And also the way in which uh, fiscal policy has affected the economy and multipliers is quite different in COVID precisely because of lockdown. I think work that Christina Romer and others have done in illustrating that uh, it's, it, it's quite fascinating. And also design. COVID was very, very lean in design, um, putting a premium on speed. And perhaps uh, we lost a little bit on the uh, nutrition sensitivity design. So that's also a trade-off that I think it's important to consider. So three quick away, the takeaways, 
one uh, diagnose and uh, and and look really at the how is the crisis panning out in in different countries because it's going to be different. Um, consider food security and nutrition responses, not standalone social protection responses. All of us have underscored the multisectorality of the problem. It's a system problem. So I think that we really need to look at social protection within the broader framework of food security and nutrition. Number three, stress test how far you can go with social protection system scale up, identify the ga gaps, look at the wealth of lessons that are emerging from COVID, and possibly when the signing op options, uh, uh, casting them and provide information on how they are financed. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's quite, uh, I think, hard uh, when looking out there and understanding how responses are financed to, to get that sort of information. And I think that uh, collectively we could improve our coordination and lesson sharing uh, the more information and detailed information is provided also on the sources of financing. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, all those all those conclusions and, and takeaways and, and concrete steps. That's that's brilliant. Um, so that brings us to the end of today's event. Um, thank you so much to all the participants for having made time to join us. A special thank you to to our speakers. Um, to um, uh, as well as our co-organizer, uh, socialprotection.org. Um, the video from this session, as well as the presentations and the summary of the discussions will be shortly published um, on the webinars event page at socialprotection.org. As I said, we're also um, going to, to wrap up those, uh, those final questions that we didn't get a chance to answer. Um, and please make time to, um, to fill out the survey to this roundtable discussion because your feedback helps us to improve and, and pick up topics that are relevant, um, relevant to you. So goodbye to everyone. Uh, thank you so much. And we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you.